So with that, I'd like to introduce our team. Today, we're joined by Yang Ching Chu, project manager with the city of Bothell. Charles Smith, project manager with consultant Reed Middleton. Whitney Rierick, that's me. I'm a facilitator with PRR. Daniel Ruiz is our Spanish interpreter. Yuran Wang is our Mandarin interpreter. And I'll hand this off to you, Yang Ching. Thanks, Whit Thank you, Whitney. Hi, um, and welcome to our workshop to, on the Roundabout Project. Thanks for joining us. Today, we are talking about the new roundabout that the city is planning to build at the Meridian Avenue South and the 240th Street Southwest, Southeast. We will discuss why we choose a roundabout versus other alternatives the different features of a roundabout and how to use one. We will reserve time in the middle and at the end of the presentation to answer questions. If you have questions while we are presenting, please type this into the Q&A box. <clears throat> this is the first roundabout in the city of Basel. The project will include safety improvements, such as ramps, sidewalks, signage, street illuminations, and crosswalks. Other improvements may include updates to the storm drainage, utility relocation, pavement marking, and other related work. This project is funded by the State of Washington's Highway and Safety Improvement Program. The goal of this program is to reduce serious injury crashes. Your input is important to the success of Basel's first roundabout project. We will keep you informed throughout design and construction. We are in design now and will start construction in summer of 2023. Meridian Avenue and the 240th Southwest is an important intersection for the region. It is a crossroad between neighborhoods and the cities. I'll hand this off to Charles to introduce design and the use of roundabout. Thank you, Yongqing. Currently, this intersection is an always stop with only partial sidewalks and no bike lanes. There is frequent congestion and delays for vehicles during the busiest hours of the day. In addition to the congestion, there have also been a relatively high number of collisions at this intersection. Roundabouts, like the one we're building, help to reduce congestion and improve traffic flow. They are also shown to improve safety by reducing collisions. They're often more cost-effective and use less space than a traditional signalized intersection. Next, I'd like to share some of the traffic analysis we've done for this project. Level of service is a measure of traffic flow in an intersection. In this chart, you can see letter grades and colors. Just like on a report card, A's and B's are good, and an F is a failing grade. The graphic also includes average delay per vehicle. This is an estimate of how many seconds each vehicle will wait to get through the intersection during the busiest time of day. The intersection currently operates with a level of service D and an average delay of 26 seconds per vehicle. Not great, but not terrible. The no build option estimates how the intersection will function in the future if no changes are made. With continued growth and development, the increased traffic projections result in a level of service F and an average delay of 88 seconds per vehicle, more than triple the existing peak delay. In order to improve the traffic flow for the intersection, the project team evaluated a traffic signal option as well as a roundabout alternative. The traffic signal option has a delay of almost 30 seconds, comparable to existing conditions. The roundabout option improves operations, resulting in a level of service B 
and much shorter delay of only 11.5 seconds per vehicle. Let's take a closer look at some of the safety benefits of roundabouts. This graphic shows where collisions usually occur at a four-way intersection. These are called conflict points. The circles indicate where car-to-car -car crashes or conflicts typically occur. The squares indicate where car-to-pedestrian collisions usually occur. You can see that there are far more opportunities for conflicts to occur in a typical four-way intersection. The roundabout reduces the total conflict points from 40 all the way down to 16. The primary reasons for the improved safety of roundabouts are fewer number of conflict points as shown in the previous slide and the slower vehicle speeds. Roundabouts require drivers to yield before entering the intersection and lower speeds to between 15 and 25 miles per hour. Curved road, and one-way travel around the roundabout eliminate the possibility for T-bone and head-on collisions. Studies by the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety and Federal Highway Administration show that roundabouts reduce overall collisions by 37%, reduce injury collisions by 75%, reduce fatality collisions by 90%, and reduce pedestrian collisions by 40%. Roundabouts allow for continuous flow of traffic. Unlike intersections with traffic signals, roundabouts do not require drivers to stop and wait for a green light to get through the intersection. In a roundabout, traffic is not required to stop, only yield, so the intersection can handle more traffic in the same amount of time. Studies by the Federal Highway Administration have found that roundabouts can increase traffic capacity by 30 to 50% compared to traditional intersections. And the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety also found that roundabouts contributed to an 89% reduction in traffic delays. Roundabouts can help improve air quality by lowering emissions from idling cars. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety found that installing roundabouts instead of traffic signals or stop signs reduces carbon dioxide emissions by 23 to 34%. A roundabout may need more property at the intersection itself, but will often take up less space on the streets approaching the roundabout. Because roundabouts can handle greater volumes of traffic more efficiently than traffic signals, roundabouts usually require fewer lanes approaching the intersection. That's probably enough from an engineer. Whitney, I'll turn it back to you for questions. Okay, thanks, Charles. So it looks like we've got some questions. And um, we'll see if Yun Ching or Charles, um, please jump in with whoever uh, has the answer to this question. Let's start with the question about safety. Has a safety study been completed for this project? Will that be a Charles question? Sure, I can take that one. Um, Yun Ching might have some things to add on other things that the city has done as well. But the project team has looked at safety. Um, specifically, one of the things we look at during the design is looking at approach speeds for the intersection and how fast vehicles are coming up to the intersection. Uh, one of the things that we do uh, is make sure that the geometry uh, for vehicles coming up to the intersection uh, slows the vehicles down prior to getting to those conflict points with pedestrians and other vehicles. Um, and we've also looked at sidewalk connections and um, connections for, for bicycles as well to provide those facilities um, that the existing intersections do not provide. So Charles, I think in your answer, you, you touched on this, but Tom was asking if it traffic load growth protect projection has been made for the intersection over the next five to 10 years? Yes, that's a great question. So um, probably the most convoluted slide we, we looked at was my, my traffic analysis slide. Um, so those projections for future growth, uh, the, project, the, the horizon year for the analysis is 2045. 
And that essentially takes that, that projected growth from now until then um, all the way through. So whatever that, I don't know offhand what that um, growth rate is, what percentage per year, um, but that is applied to the traffic modeling um, to make sure that we account for that future growth and the, the, the increased number of vehicles um, for those future years. Just to add the growth rate we are using here is 2%. Okay, 2%, thank you. Um, so an anonymous asker is wondering about, uh, would like evidence that roundabouts are as safe, are safe as a bus stop for all grades and pedestrians. So let's see, um, I'm trying to interpret that one because I think roundabouts are about cars and bus stops. I think usually cars aren't supposed to stop at a bus stop there. So um, I'm trying to, let's move on to the rest of that question. Why are you not putting in a light? So I imagine that means a um, traffic light did you want to talk a little bit more about how about the advantages of a, of a roundabout over a in signalized intersection? Sure. Yeah, we definitely did look at a traffic signal option at this location. Um, one of the alternatives was a traffic signal, and we also looked at um, a couple of different roundabout variations as well. Um, and the preferred alternative based on um, the traffic operations and additional safety components uh, for the project was the roundabout. So it was the preferred alternative when comparing cost um, and the other factors for the intersection. The roundabout was the, was the um, alternative that was selected. So safety and traffic flow, I think you also looked at, right? Yes. Yeah. And if the, if the question is referring to like lighting, instead of a traffic signal, we, we are providing additional um, lighting at the, at the intersection as well. Uh, so that would be for pedestrians and cyclists? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, we got a shout out from somebody who lives just a few streets from the project and thinks roundabout is a fantastic plan. And Seth, who's a person uh, with this comment, says the intersection has had a few bad crashes over the years, and this will be a massive safety improvement and functional improvement. Okay, Ariel is asking, when will preliminary plans be available? So let's start with that. When will pre preliminary plans, <laughs> the tongue twister, preliminary plans be available? So we've actually completed 30% design for that, that initial design phase. Um, in some of the slides coming up, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the, the schedule for the project. Um, Young Chin, do you wanna add anything about uh, when plans might be available? Well, as, well, as you mentioned, a 30% plan has been completed. And then we are expecting a 60% design to be completed by for 2022. Uh, so we will talk about the schedule um, later after this one, after the Q&A session. Okay. So we'll look a little, uh, we'll have a, we do have a slide about the, the um, timeline, but that's another part of this question from Ariel is the, how long is the construction timeline? So when will construction start and, and when do you anticipate an ending? Right now, so, uh, um, sorry, Yanjing. I was just yeah. gonna say, we're anticipating construction the summer of 2023. Okay. And how long will it take to, to build if it starts in the summer of 2023? Ideally, the bulk, the construction will be done while school is out. So thinking oh, late terrific. June start and be done by September. Okay. And uh, how much notice of closure? That might be a Yang Ching answer. 
Well, typically during the construction, we will send the link closure um, a week of the, uh, the road that needs to be closed. But we try to keep at least one lane open during the construction. Okay, so there won't be complete closure. Yeah. Okay. But you're gonna give a, a notification about a week before to give everybody a heads up? Yes. Okay. And uh, I have a question about pedestrian safety. Um, do you have, I mean, this slide shows us potential conflict points for pedestrians. Do you have any other data around pedestrian conflict? Uh, well, again, one of the best aspects of a roundabout is that you're only crossing one lane of traffic at a time. So there are raised medians. And we talked a little bit more. Uh, there's another slide later in the slide deck that, that talks about bicycles and pedestrians. Uh, the roundabout is laid out with uh, traffic islands splitter islands um, approaching the, the intersection. So there is a pedestrian refuge uh, provided by those. So uh, a pedestrian only has to cross one lane, then has a refuge with the, within the pedestrian island and then crosses the, the additional lane. So they're only looking in one direction at a time, um, which, is, which is safer than the multiple ways um, vehicles can uh, can be coming in a traditional four-way intersection. Terrific. And yeah, we have this slide here that kind of shows that, but we do have a slide coming up. Why don't we um, save the rest of the questions for our second Q&A session towards the end so people can see some of these too. Does that sound good? Let's, uh, let's get back into the presentation and don't worry, everybody. We're going to answer all of the questions here that you've posted. Um, okay, so let's jump back into it. So All right, using, um, Charles. Oh, sorry, I jumped, I jumped the gun there. Uh, <laughs> so here are a few things to remember when using a roundabout. Watch for pedestrians and bicycles as you approach the intersection. Yield to drivers already in the roundabout. Do not stop in the roundabout. And watch for pedestrians and bicycles as you exit the roundabout. When approaching the roundabout, there will be a yellow roundabout ahead warning sign. Similarly, there will be pedestrian crossing warning signs at those crosswalk locations. Vehicles are moving at a slower rate of speed in roundabouts, typically 15 to 20 miles per hour. This makes them safer for cyclists and pedestrians when compared to a signalized intersection where vehicles are moving much faster. You can see that in roundabouts, crosswalks are further back from the traffic circulating in the center, allowing more time for drivers to react to people in the crosswalk. The raised traffic islands between lanes of traffic give pedestrians a safe place to wait while crossing the street. This also means people on foot only need to look one direction at a time while crossing. Bicyclists, bicyclists can choose to ride through the roundabout with traffic or exit the roadway onto the sidewalk and walk their bicycles through the pedestrian crosswalks. Here we're gonna show you a video of how cyclists can pass through a roundabout. Okay, just give us one quick minute to queue up the video for you. You have two options when it comes to riding a bike through the roundabout, depending on your comfort level. Experienced cyclists may choose to take the travel lane and ride through the roundabout with traffic. Approaching the roundabout, signal your intent to merge into the traffic lane. Riders must obey the same rules of the roundabout as if they were driving a car. Watch for pedestrians, yield to vehicles already in the roundabout, and circle the roundabout to your right until you reach your desired exit. Less experienced cyclists may also choose to ride around the roundabout on the protected outside path. The bike lane ramps up to the sidewalk path and allows a bicyclist to use the dedicated crossing locations similar to a pedestrian. At some roundabouts, dedicated bicycle crossings will be provided and marked with green paint. In all cases, bicyclists should be cautious and yield to people walking. 
Okay, thanks. If you're wondering about larger vehicles like trucks and buses and how fire trucks get through a roundabout, the design will accommodate larger vehicles too. We do this through the use of something called an apron. You can see the truck in this image is driving up on the center of the roundabout. That's the apron. The back wheels of large vehicles can ride up onto the apron due to its lower smooth curve, allowing the rear of the truck to successfully complete the turn. The truck apron is raised to discourage use by smaller vehicles and emphasize that it is not a normal travel lane. Here's a video of how trucks and other large vehicles maneuver in a roundabout using the apron. All right, queuing up another video. The central island of most roundabouts has a truck apron to allow easy movement of tractor trailer trucks and buses. The truck apron is a paved area, usually separated by a mountable curve from the circulatory roadway. It gives trucks and other large vehicles extra room to navigate while still controlling passenger car speeds. This roundabout in Bend, Oregon is used by many tractor trailer trucks and school buses. The truck apron is nearly flush with the roadway, allowing trailer tires to roll over it. Roundabouts are typically large enough for emergency vehicles to travel fully within the circulatory roadway, as shown here in Encinitas, California. The rear tires of large emergency vehicles, such as fire trucks, can roll over the truck apron if needed. While the curvature of roundabouts increases travel time to navigate the intersection, emergency vehicles often experience similar delays at other types of intersections, because queues there are often much shorter. This residential roundabout in Wisconsin is navigated by a fire truck, which does not need to use the truck apron. Truck aprons can be designed with smooth curves, as shown in this Nebraska example. This allows the rear tires of the truck to comfortably mount the truck apron without risking rollover. Okay. And now we're back to Yangqing. Oh, Yangqing, you're muted. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> Here is the major milestone for the project. Our goal is to finish the 30% design by spring and have the 60% design by fall of this year. Your comments and the feedback will be included in our design of the roundabout. We are also talking to communities in the area through interviews with Cascadia Bike Club, King County Mobility Coalition Group, Utah Basel, Cascadia College, and North Shore School District. By spring 2023, we will have our 100% design completed, and the construction will begin in mid-2023. Neighbors should keep a lookout for a postcard informing them when construction will begin. Whitney. Thanks, Xiang Jing. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share and let's get back to questions. Okay, and we can pull up, if either of you would like me to pull some um, visuals back up, you just let me know, okay? So, um, we have a question about data on near miss collisions. And so the um, asker here asks that not having many roundabouts in our area, I find that drivers often are not comfortable approaching them and don't fully understand how flow is supposed to work. So how do you see that translating to um, collision data, the unfamiliarity part? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that we often look at in our design and modeling of roundabouts is a environmental factor, which is really meant to kind of replicate that unfamiliarity or people that aren't used to driving a roundabout. Um, it doesn't really 
equate to more collisions or accidents. Usually what it means is you can't quite get as many vehicles through the intersection as you normally would just because people are going slower. Usually when they're, when they're not comfortable with it, they'll go slower and they'll wait for more of a gap than would normally be needed. Um, and so over time, as people become more and more familiar with them, um, that capacity improves as people get more comfortable with finding a gap in the, in the, in the circulating lane and getting through the intersection. So by the time we get out to where those worst case scenarios in our, in our um, traffic analysis, where we're looking at year 2045. So we'll be well into that, um, that familiarity uh, by the time we get close to those areas when we're ter in terms of capacity. So um, yes, there will be a learning curve for, um, for the first you know, one or two years at the, at the roundabout, but we haven't seen that that equates to more collisions. It's usually just, you're not getting quite as many cars through the intersection as you, as you normally could um, if people are more familiar with it. I see. So, so you find that people are new to roundabouts um, actually are maybe more cautious because they're not familiar yet. Yes. Yeah. So they might, they might go slower or wait for, uh, be more cautious and wait longer than they need to um, before entering the, the, the roundabout. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, David and Colleen are asking about their home, which they say is about 500 feet from the intersection on the south side of 240th. They say it can be a challenge getting in and out of their driveway with the current intersection. With the roundabout traffic will not stop. How will the, this impact them getting in and out of their driveway? Um, actually, one of the great things about roundabouts is that traffic does not stop. At a signal, we, we stop that direction of traffic and then all of those cars stack up as they stop and wait and idle. Um, where any queuing or backup for a roundabout is a rolling backup. So because it's not a full stop condition, it's a yield condition that those cars are still moving. So they're not completely stopped. If there's, if there's five or 10 or even 15 cars waiting to get to and through the intersection, they're still rolling. So it actually is easier to find gaps typically than if there was a large queue length or a large backup of cars just stopped and waiting to get through the traffic signal. Okay, thank you. Um, and one of the other things is if, if making a left turn out of your um, driveway is really difficult, um, and if it was turning to turn right, um, or, or basically you, you now could just go up to the, the roundabout and go around it if you needed to um, as another option that you wouldn't typically have, um, almost using it like a, like a U-turn option. Yeah, I could see that. So, um... A number of people are asking about the bus stop on the corner, and I think it's um, it's a school bus stop, which some folks are saying um, that the existing condition is dangerous and it has poor visibility for pedestrians in the dark. So what's being done about the bus stop at this intersection? That's a great question. Yes, the, uh, the existing bus stop is not good, not great. There's... Uh, there are challenges with it. Um, the with the, the 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 project that bus stop will be relocated probably prior to the intersection, so it won't be it won't be in the intersection or right on the corner. It will be moved back slightly to provide that area for um, for the bus stop in advance of the um, entrance to the roundabout. Okay, so it'll still be there and it'll be better. <laughs> Sounds like. It should be safer, yes. Okay, safer, good. Um, get more shout outs too, people who like the idea. What is the total cost of right-of-way acquisition for the project? Uh, we have some estimates at this time that's um, kind of a, a, a work in progress for final numbers, but um, Yan Ching, if you wanna share, um, I'll, I'll leave that up to you if you wanna um, share anything about specific right-of-way information yeah our current uh, estimates estimated the cost for the write-off we face 
is about $160,000. But this is still waiting for approval before we can move forward. So it's still in under in the approval, yeah, in the review. Okay. Um, we have a couple of questions about sidewalks. What is the plan for adding sidewalks around and leading up to the roundabout? So the project will add sidewalks throughout the project area. So we will now have sidewalks on all, all sides of the, of the roundabout, all, um, all four legs of the intersection will now have crosswalks. Um, if you want to, uh, the graphics that we've, we've been showing um, up there do indicate kind of where those sidewalks are located. Um, yeah, so we do have crosswalks on all four legs uh, and sidewalks um, throughout the uh, project area itself and provide connections for future sidewalks as well if there's um, additional work done on any of those legs that do not have sidewalks currently. Thank you. Um, Jack and Vicki are asking about southbound traffic where we have serious southbound traffic issues where they do not yield or even stop for cross traffic. And it will leave east and westbound traffic with even worse delays from the theoretical perfect. Uh, this person has 30 years of experience at this intersection. How can you ensure southbound traffic will follow the traffic flow rules? Could speed bumps be used to slow the southbound traffic? Um, so the 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 one of the pluses for a roundabout is that southbound traffic that's coming down the hill um, along Meridian, it's not just a straight shot any longer. So they have to slow down as they're coming into that curvature as they approach the roundabout. Um, the, the, the curvature and that configuration of the raised median island and the, and the new curb that's being added for that leg um, forces them to turn and, and causing them to slow down. So rather than a straight shot down the hill, um, now they will be slowing down so they can be that 15 to 25 mile an hour um, speed when they enter and use the roundabout. And correct me if I'm wrong, Charles, but it seems like the roundabout will be a larger visual too than a simple stop sign off on the side that somebody coming down the hill maybe is going faster than the speed limit, you know, too fast. Um, and they'll see something there. They'll see the signs maybe that say roundabout ahead. Um, and then they'll also see this, a larger thing with cars going around that's a more prominent say than a stop sign as currently or in a signalized intersection. Is that true? Uh, yes, there is the visual cue of the center island itself. Um, you know, there's now something blocking. If, if, you know, if they want to go straight through, they're going to have to jump at least three curbs um, <laughs> to do so. So there are, uh, there are some significant uh, deterrents for, for just plowing through um, the intersection there. Um, how about 18 wheelers? Will the roundabout handle 18 wheelers? Yes. So, um, there are, uh, this intersection isn't designed for very large trucks. Um, it is a residential area and not, um, in the middle of an industrial zone. So we're not anticipating huge, um, semis going through this intersection regularly. The truck apron and the um, mountable splitter islands do allow for large vehicles to traverse the intersection. Um, on those rare occasions where one of those very large vehicles comes in, um, they'll have to go slow to use the truck apron, but they can get through the intersection. Okay. But you don't anticipate a lot of semis up that way, huh? No, the, okay. you, the, the design vehicle for this, um, this intersection is, yeah, not, nothing, nothing like those large, large semis. But they can get through there if they need to. Okay. Uh, will the roundabout have a planter box in the middle, like all of the examples in the videos? Um, the center island may or may not be planted. Um, it's one of those things that um, we haven't decided yet in the design, um, but there will be 
that portion that's shown as green um, is is not mountable. So that will that's an area where there'll be signs and maybe some landscape rocks or something other uh, feature there that um, may or may not be plantings, but it will be a visual um, break in the center of that roundabout. Okay. Um, another question about access for homes nearby. Um, and you mentioned that um, that it can be easier to get out near an intersection from a driveway. Will this apply to all of the homes in the area? Yes, the design shouldn't um, restrict any access that, that is currently there. So, so we've accounted for existing driveways uh, in the design to make sure that, that uh, homeowners still have access okay. as they currently do. And one of our slides showed a two lane roundabout, uh, but this is going to be a one lane roundabout, correct? That's correct. One of the visuals that we had for, um, I think those were from the Washington State Department of Transportation website talking about roundabouts and the examples that they had shown were, were, were multi-lane roundabouts. These, this is just a single lane roundabout. Okay. I'm gonna pause for a minute for our translators. Sorry, I'm talking fast. I was going fast too. <laughs> so the size of the intersection, um, how, do, how will it compare the planned roundabout that you're looking at now? How will that compare size-wise to the intersection in the truck video? Um, it depends on which, which intersection in the truck video. This is a, um, a smaller, more compact, roundabout than say the one in Bend, which was a much large, where you saw the large vehicles going through. Sure. Um, this is more consistent with the one in the video that shows the fire truck in the residential area. So uh, the one where they're talking about how the fire truck can go through without using the truck apron, um, that this is very similar to that intersection where school buses and a fire truck like that can use the circulating lane without having to, to go up onto uh, the truck apron at all. Okay. We've had a lot of questions about the bus stop and kids and crosswalks. So can you talk a little bit more about the safety for kids who are, say, going from one side to another to the bus stop? Sure. Um, again, this is uh, compared to a the existing condition. Uh, this is a much safer option. We do have crosswalks on all four legs now. Um, so with the, wherever that, that bus stop is relocated to, um, there will be full access um, from all legs of the intersection from each, each cross, each side road um, to get there. And are there not currently crosswalks on all four sides? I believe there's only crosswalks on two, but there, uh, I might be wrong on that. Okay. I know that they're not on all four. Okay. So we, um, will there be flashing beacons or other safety enhancements? At this time, we're not planning on, in, on installing a flashing beacon. Um, typically for multi-lane roundabouts, so if we had two lanes going through the roundabout, we install flashing beacons at those locations. For a single lane roundabout, um, at this point, we we're planning for signage um, for those crosswalks and those crossings, but not a flashing beacon. Okay. Um, since we're talking about lights, um, is there a plan to reduce light pollution? Does the city of Bothell have a plan for that with new street lights in this area and other areas? That might be a question for Yang Ching. Oh, at this stage, we haven't uh, started lighting design yet. I think we will look at this option maybe during the 60% design. Okay, so that's coming up. Okay. And one just, thing, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, one thing I will say about lighting design is that whatever street lights we choose um, will have what they call cutoff optics so that they won't be casting light back um, away from the street. It'll minimize how much light pollution or light is directed away from the intersection and trying to localize it 
um, where we need it for pedestrians and the crossings. Okay. Um, there are questions about where other um, roundabouts have been located. Um, do we have any data about safety about roundab roundabouts that are located on the side of a hill? And again, wondering about the safety of them because of the downhill approach in one direction, and also about you know roundabouts in residential areas. Is there data about that or yeah, close to residential driveways especially? Uh, this intersection is not unique in terms of location within a residential area or close to schools. Um, we have many, I don't have any data uh, that I can provide you for specific comparisons, um, but I do have, uh, we do have a lot of experience with roundabouts um, in locations such as this. Uh, the, the approach coming down the hill, you, uh, the grades uh, are not excessive and have, have been accounted for. Um, it's certainly not the steepest uh, approach to a roundabout that we have designed in the past. Um, and again, we do have uh, similar uh, similar roundabouts that have, uh, I would say, some cases even closer driveways than um, some of these here. So uh, those driveways have been accounted for and um, included in the in the design for this project. Where will the material and equipment staging be? That is yet to be determined. Okay. Yeah, because we're still um, a year or so out from construction, correct? Okay. Correct. Um, will the east side of Meridian be paved slash widened south of the intersection to connect to the widened paved shoulder one or two parcels south of the proposed project? Um, no, currently we're not we're not going to pave all the way out to where that that sidewalk is on that leg. So we do have some green space uh, between where our um, our travel lane is approaching the intersection. So there will continue to be that existing parking on the north side of 240th to the east of the intersection, um, and then you know similar to what's shown in the graphics that we had, um, it'll taper down to our two lane approach before it um, enters the roundabout. Okay. So um, about the school bus routes, I might know the answer to this question because you said you're going to attempt to have construction during the school break. Um, so multiple school bus routes are going through this intersection. How will they be affected during construction? It sounds like they won't be running during construction, right? Ideally, the majority of the construction will be completed when school is not in session. Um, if, there, if there are any lane restrictions during construction that overlaps with the school year, um, it will be laid out to make sure that those buses can get through the intersection. Okay. And Yang Ching already mentioned that um, there will be some lanes that will stay open. They will, the intersection will never be completely closed. Correct. Correct. That's the yeah. We're not we're not planning on any full closure of the intersection at this at this time. Okay. And then I think this is a question for Yang Ching. Uh, could temporary crosswalk paint be added to all existing crossings as a stopgap for the current pedestrians crossings? Yang Cheng, is that something the city could do? That I will talk to our city uh, traffic engineer okay. to see what the city can do. It sounds like there's a lot of concern for the current situation of that mm -hmm. intersection and that, which I'm sure is a large driver for this project, correct? So, okay, well, um, let me just... Uh, just making sure we captured everything. So we've already answered about um, 
low light and trying to reduce light pollution, improving plantings. That's an option that will be addressed later. And okay, I think we've captured everything here. Um, so unless anybody has any quick last minute questions, oh, oh, if we have additional questions after this meeting, who do we send them to? We send them to Yang Ching, and I have a slide for that in a second. Um, but thank you so much. I'll just share my screen one more time. Here is where you can learn more. And uh, bothelwa.gov slash roundabout, or you can email project manager Yangqing Chu at yangqing.chu at that's y o n q i n g dot z h u at bothelwa dot gov. But I'd like to thank everybody for some great questions and answers. And yeah, thanks to our panelists and to our interpreters. And I want to encourage everybody to stay engaged. This has been really great. Appreciate the turnout. And that's all we have for tonight. Thanks again for joining us. <laughs>